Amen. 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 Welcome to Tuesday night prayer. I'm going to go back to the basics tonight. Uh, this uh, teaching book, the prayer study course by Ken D. Hagen. I just uh, have I've dug this back out for myself, and I've been doing some things, and I just felt that um, this united prayer was attractive or something that um, that we could use again. This is a reminder. Um, and he tells some funny things in it because he was Baptist when he was uh, younger, and some of the things that he started experiencing after he got healed, and and he, he's talking about how things that we just think that about prayer, about anything, uh, how we think about it, that um, we have our own our own theories about some stuff, and and he and he said. Um, Often in, in ignorance, we believe some stuff that's not from the Word. It's not in line with the Word of God. And he said, for instance, when he entered the full gospel circles, he said, everybody prayed out loud. And, um, and he said it really bothered him. And everybody was praying out loud, and they were all praying together. And, and if you come out of a, a traditional church, I mean, I went to prayer meetings my whole life in the Baptist church, and one person would lead out, and then the next person would lead out, or you might just have, you know, not everybody prayed, and nobody prayed out while the other person was praying, right? And so I get it when he says that he, it really bothered him when he started going into those, um, into the full gospel circles, and um, he said, all I heard was a noise, and he said, to me, I couldn't concentrate what I was saying for the Lord. And he said, I would try to pray, and he said, it was just plain hard to concentrate. And he said, I was raised in a Southern Baptist church. And like I said, he just, he remembered people just praying one, one at a time. And, um, and he said, they didn't pray like the Christians in the book of Acts, where he grew up. And um, he said, what caused him in the first place to get into the full gospel circles was because of his healing. He had received his healing, and he said, um, I never had heard of full gospel before. And I guess I never had heard of full gospel either until my father-in-law had a full gospel church, but I, I never knew there was a church called full gospel. Yeah. Um, anyway, and he said, I didn't know anybody believed in healing except for me. He said he didn't know of anybody that believed in, in that part of it. So he said after he got his healing, they, this full gospel circle put up a tent in his in his area. And um, he said he didn't go to the meetings because I think at that time he was a pastor, was he not? Probably. Yeah, yeah I think he, yeah. he said he was busy yeah. with church work. So yeah. um, he said his grandmother got saved in an old-fashioned Methodist camp meeting. <laughs> and he said that they would be all praying all together out loud. And um, they would go to the altar and get saved, and he said um, she had asked him to go to this tent meeting with her, and, and he said, well, why would I go to that tent meeting with you? And she said, well, because she said the, the pastor preaches the way you preach, what you believe, and he almost sounds like you, she said. So he said, um, I went and I stood outside one night, outside the tent, and he said, I listened to the pastor. I and his message, and he said, um, I enjoyed what he said. So he said, the next week, I did, he went, and he went inside, and he attended every service of that week. He said, after the pastor preached, he would come back through the crowd, and he would shake hands with everybody. And, uh, and he would say to the people, like, ask them if they were Christians. And then he said, it seemed like everybody went to the altar after the pastor would speak shake their hands. So he said he came along to him and he said he asked me if I was Christian. He said yes I told him I was a pastor. And he said well it wouldn't hurt you to go to the altar to pray. <laughs> and um, Kenneth Hagin said at first he said I felt a little bit insulted that he would say that to me. Um, he said we don't do things this way in our church. And uh, But he said I thought the more I thought of it the more I thought he was right. So he said I had heard that I went up front and prayed. Prayer's not going to hurt me. So, so he said, I went down there and he prayed, and he said, 
it bothered me because people were all gathered together. They were loud and they were praying out. Like everybody was praying at one time. And he said, and I was just used to praying quietly. So he said, and I thought back because I watched him on, on YouTube here a week or so ago. And he, what a way he had come from being yeah. quiet and praying <laughs> quietly to yeah. that night. And, um, and many nights that he prayed like that. He said, um, so he started attending. They built a church, this whole gospel circle, built a church after the tent meetings. And he said, I started attending their services because it helped me and it blessed me. And he said, I would go down to the altar and pray after the services because I believe back then they always had altar service after. There was, they all went to the altar to pray after mm -hmm. the services. And he said, I would get as far away from everybody else that was praying. Like I'd get over in my corner so that I could pray quietly and could, could concentrate on what I was saying. And he said, I ventured one time to say to somebody, God is not hard of hearing. And this person replied to him, but God is not, is not uh, nervous either. <laughs> so he said, um, he said, but I didn't know any better. He said, at that time, that was all I knew. Yeah. That was what I knew. And he said, I was sure they were wrong about this kind of prayer. But he said, I got thinking about it, and I remembered, he said, these people believed in divine healing. And they were right about that. So he said, maybe they're right about this type of praying. So he said, I, um, what he started to do, he started reading through the Bible. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the book of Acts, and I'm going to underline with a red pencil everywhere that the believers prayed in a group, with two or more praying together. And so he said, as he prayed, as the way they prayed back in the book of Acts. So as he did that, he said, I really began studying the word. And he said, the, the Lord showed me every argument that I had against praying quietly. He said, as I went through the book of Acts, he said, I couldn't find one single place where they would call on one person in the group to call, to pray or to lead. He said, they never called on one person. He said, I found, in fact, several places where they said they lifted their voices and they all prayed at once. And they all prayed out loud. <coughs> and he said, this was known as corporate or united praying. Um, so he said, the next time I went to the full gospel service, I got right in the middle. Of <laughs> and he said, I was praying around the altar with them. And he said, I finally realized that I wasn't just praying for me to hear. I was praying God. And um, so he said, somebody might ask, and I, I'm sure we've all thought this, how can God hear all of us praying at one time? How does he hear that? But it's not just our group that might be praying. How many hundreds of thousands of millions and billions of people are praying, but that he, he hears us all at the same time? He said, after my mind got renewed with the word, I got blessed in a way that I had never got blessed before by praying with, with the people. He said, um, we do need our own private devotions. But he said that there, were, um, there are times that we need to pray together as a united corporate group. He said, I was convinced already about praying out loud, but then when he started reading through Acts, he said, Paul and Silas in Acts was a clincher. And what happened when they prayed. Um, and we all know that story about them being in prison and how uh, they prayed at midnight and uh, they were bleeding, the feet were in stocks, their backs were bleeding, and they were in the inmost prison. But it says at midnight they prayed. That's a good time to pray, he said. It's actually midnight was when it actually happened. And, and the, to them. And he said, I believe the word midnight is also significant in other ways. Midnight can be symbolic of times of testing and trials that we are going through. It can be midnight in our life, in, even in the daytime. And that's a good time to pray when it's midnight. When you're faced with tests and trials, and what happened to Saul and Paul, Paul and Silas as they prayed at midnight. Um, let's see. 
talks about them praying and um, he's, he talks about sitting when they were praying, if they had been praying quiet, like, like he had said, how he used to pray quietly, he said, those prisoners and that jailer would never have heard them because yeah. um, it has to be on our lips before somebody hears it, right? Like you can pray quietly in your heart, but be, for them to hear it, um, and he said that was the clincher for him, was when they were praying out loud and, and they were praising, um, and it had an effect on the prisoners. We don't see enough of this kind of praying and praising God out loud in the churches today. After I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I left my denominational church, he said. And I uh, accepted a pastorate of the full gospel church where the people knew how to pray like this. And um, in the same church that he went to, there had been a revival at, at one time. And he said people came um, to this revival not because they believed in they came actually, as it were, a show or a circus. They came actually to make fun of what was going on in this revival. But he said God entered in, and these same people who had mocked what was going on got saved. And he said those members became church of that, or became members of that wow. church that he was pastoring. And the person who told him this Perfect. said, um, folks would meet in the daytime. Like this revival, they, there would be people would meet in the daytime, they pray for the evening revival services. And one couple in the church had a son who was away, Mary came back to visit his parents, and he was attending church while he was home. And one day he was driving by the church, and he actually could hear these people praying out as he was driving by. And he went home to his father and he said, we ought to go tonight to that church service because he says they're going to have a big one. And his father said, why do you say that? And he said, because they're already at church practicing up. <laughs> they're already starting to practice in the middle of the afternoon. And he said, this, Kenneth Hagin says, I believe sometimes this is the reason yeah. we don't have a big one. Mm -hmm. We haven't practiced for it through prayer and praise. Then he talks about Silas, a bit more about Paul and Silas and being in United Prayer. And um, would we be praying if we had been beaten and our feet in stocks? Um, they were praying and singing praises to God in one accord. Something happened. Isn't it interesting that the Bible doesn't record that that earthquake touched anywhere else around? But it only shook that prison. And there's no report, he says, in the Bible of any other house or any other building being shaken. I would be surprised if the earth, I wouldn't be surprised that it only shook that prison. That they were praising and praying God, praising and um, praying to God. But bless God, that jailer was shaken. And so were those prisoners, right? Uh, the Bible says the very foundation of that prison was shaken. Just just imagine what, if we got in one accord, mm -hmm. united, that we could shake the foundation of this church, wow. right? Yeah. right? It could happen. Um, and that's what happened with the prison. Prison doors open. I mean, their bonds and they came out of, their, the stocks around their feet came out of it because of that earthquake. Mm -hmm. And the prisoner, he, the jailer was going to kill himself. We all know the story. <laughs> and I thought they had escaped, but Paul told them, no, do yourself no harm, for we're all here. The jailer knew he had with, witnessed the supernatural at that time, and that those men were not ordinary men serving and working for God. The Bible says the jailer came trembling, asking, what must I do to be saved? And as a result, the power of God was wrought by the United Prayer, the United Prayer of Paul and Silas. A lot of folks today are just sitting around waiting for God to move. They say, if God sees fit, he'll move on my behalf. What if Paul and Silas had said that? Mm -hmm. While they were sitting up there, what if they had said, well, if God sees fit, he'll do something for us. But they didn't, they didn't just sit. They praised and they prayed. With that, and um, they prayed in one accord, and they sang praises to God. We need that kind of praying today. How desperately we need that kind of praying, that things begin to be shaken, 
Some people are going to be shaking too. You see, the shaking will cause some people to come to church, and it will cause some people to leave the church. Folks who don't want to change, they won't stay along very long. They won't stay around very long. Because some things believers should get rid of, such as sin, will be shaken too. And in some churches, there's even people who need to be shaken. Because they will never commit themselves to a local body and walk off of it. Those people will go when shaking begins, but other people will come to the church and they'll stay. And then he talks about Acts 4, um, again, how um, that was... Um, and they were, let's see, the early church was the Lord's United Prayer. It was talking about um, how there was threatenings and they prayed and the place was shaken. Uh, Acts 4, 23 to 31. I'm not going to go through all of that. And that happened just after uh, Peter and John had healed the crippled guy at the at Gate of Beautiful. Um, Talks about him being healed, and I'm just going to skip through here a bit. So um, then he goes down and he talks about how the places were shaken and, and compares um, Acts uh, 4:31 and uh, when the place was shaken when they came into their own temple after after they had been uh, stood before the priests and the um, Sadducees and how they had told them not to teach anymore in the name of Jesus. It's, he said, and they went to their own company, right? And it's, he says, it's good to be with your own company yeah. when you're in trouble. It's good to be with those like precious faith when you know you know how to pray and you need somebody to pray. He said, I thought many times that if this company of believers had been like the folks in some churches, they would have suggested that they nominate a committee to go and talk to these leaders to make some kind of a deal. They wouldn't have gone to prayer, is what he's saying. He said they would all get together and they'd have a committee go and talk to the leaders, the Sadducees and the priests, and, and uh, they'd make a deal. But he said this group of believers that were John and, and um, Peter's company, he said what they prayed for was for, for boldness. They did not ask God to remove their persecutions or to strike down their enemies. They didn't pray, Lord, make our way easy. In the midst of the persecution, they pray for boldness. Anyway, um, he's just talking about ushering in the glory of God through united prayer at the end of it. And, and it talks about in Second Chronicles, a uh, couple of places in chapter 5 and chapter 7. And um, he said, believers can usher in the glory of God as they join together in united prayer and praise. And, and those two uh, scriptures, they, that's what they did. He said, did you ever stop to think about when the glory of the Lord filled the temple? It was when all the people were praying and singing praises to God out loud and on our board. The glory cloud of the Lord filled that temple that the priests couldn't even stand. A white cloud came in and filled the temple. That's what United <clears throat> Prayer can do. He said, I've seen instances when people prayed until it looked like the whole building was going to shake. And he said, I've seen some of the most amazing things happen in the realm of the spirit. When people lifted their voice to God and went forward. Sometimes it seemed like the power of God would come in waves. And we, we've experienced yeah, some of this. Yeah, yeah. In some of my services, he said, every single unsaved and backslidden person in the building responded. That I didn't even have to beg and plead, they would come to the altar and pray, and every one of them would be saved. He said, I remember one service when everyone present that was sick was healed. Everyone. I've ministered in a number of services when every believer there received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We don't see that much today, but I felt the Spirit of God pass through services like a strong wind. We need more united praying. We need more vocal praying or praying out loud in one accord. Let us avail ourselves of the power that is united in the united prayer so that we don't miss out on any good thing that God has made available for us. 
Let's pray the kind of united prayer that will shake things for the kingdom of God. Amen. God, just, um, that's good. <laughs>